What's up, listeners, and welcome to SMQB's episode 177, brought to you by Assembly Software, featuring the number one case management software, Neos. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Pod. This is Rooster, and I'm pleased to be joined by the one and only House from Philadelphia. What's up, Rooster? How you doing, what House? Up? It's good. good to see you. Good, good, good. good to see you. Good to be seen. Uh, we're missing three of our uh, three of our hombres, but we hope to have a full full team next next episode. Summer vacation for yeah. the boys. Yeah. So, uh, House, let's talk about uh, who you're taking to the bar this week. So a couple of weeks ago, I tried to shut the bar down so the Phillies couldn't get in, and uh, <laughs> I'm, that st- I'm really I well, it was okay. So last night. The, the Phillies owner, John Middleton, made this comment that was like, let's stop messing around. Like, let's get our act together. Um, so I, I just want to ask John Middleton to pull up a seat and I'm going to buy him multiple rounds because I love an owner being outspoken like that and saying, come on, guys, this is this is like the real deal now. We've got the best possible team we could assemble and let's get it going. This city will be heartbroken after that torrid start if we just drip into the postseason and fade away you've been there before yeah you know like most new york fans i'm bitter about uh executives present and past and so the person i'm taking to the bar is dave gettleman oh uh, god that guy former gm of the giants now that daniel jones looks looks like he's going to be benched mid-season in favor of either Drew Locke or Tommy Cutlets. And um, the guy that, uh, who was that guy from Florida who who uh, we drafted in that horrendous draft where you t- your team took advantage of us, Kadarius oh, Tony. K- Kadarius He's Tony. about yeah, to be sure. cut by the Chiefs. Chiefs. He's so terrible. I, th- I think after those two episodes i would love for gettleman just to privately admit to me he's the worst gm in history okay but not to like hang too long on this shitty giants team but gettleman didn't sign danny dimes to that contract no no, right? da- no joe shane is is a uh, runner up for worst gm in giants history at least <laughs> he's got blood on his hands on that yeah he's terrible he's terrible anyway on to on to bigger and more exciting things than the Giants, who whose season is already over, unfortunately. You know, after weeks of uh, r- really having nothing but the Olympics and baseball, we now have football right around the corner and football, which you have behind you on your screen, started up with the EPL and the German Bundesliga. Before we get to that, though, tell us, uh, casual fans, what it means to the U.S. men's national team to have this new coach. How do you pronounce Mauricio it? Mauricio Pochettino. Yeah, Poch. Pochettino. This is, uh, we, we have a real coach. We, we This is far and away the most experienced, most disciplined, um, most accomplished coach U.S. men's national team has ever had. And we just we just saw uh the great uh change over in the women's team and and almost that surprise gold that very young team when Emma Hayes came over from from England this is this is an interesting comparison cuz Mauricio Pochettino Poch came over after taking Tottenham from the Premier League to a really great great Premier League season and then finalists in the Champions League. Um, then he was over at PSG, where some claim he underwhelmed a little bit, mainly because he had Mbappe, he had Neymar, he had Messi, and while that's easy to win the you know Ligue One, the Ligue One in France, there was greater heights that that team had that they didn't achieve. So some of the naysayers about Poch are like, well, if he couldn't win or get far in Champions League with that, you know, Troika of those players, how 
how can you expect him to do much with this American team? But and then then he moved to Chelsea. There were all kinds of problems there between ownership changeover, players being injured. He really had a mess on his hands. And even then, he was improving the team by season end. I think for this team, it is exactly what America needs and is going to want. He's a disciplinarian. He's apparently infamous for his really, really tough practices. He's all about grit and determination. He drives these players really hard. Uh, we have players like Anthony Robinson in our defense, Tyler Adams in our midfield, who will thrive in that environment. It'd be interesting to see how folks like Gio Reyna and Christian Pulisic and some of our scorers, Tim Weah, how, how they'll do in, in this system. But I think it gives us really, really solid chance for 2026. I think overall, as American soccer fans, we should be very, very excited about this signing. It's about as good as we could get. If we weren't going to get Jurgen Klopp, if we weren't going to get Thomas Tuchel, this is a home run. Good. Let's hope it works out. It seems like Chelsea's still a mess after last weekend. Um, oh, they know, just – I mean, we'll get into it. It's crazy. It's one of these – I don't know what the comparison is. We've probably seen it in American sports recently where you just spend, 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 spend and automatically expect the results. But they just have – a lot of golden pieces without the chemistry they need to to put it together on the pitch. So, so the EPL kicked off and the Bundesliga kicked off. What are you, what are you looking forward to this year in the EPL? What should we be excited about? I mean, is anyone going to be able well, to beat uh, Man City or Arsenal? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I, it, the EPL definitely splits off into kind of three groups. Like you said, you got Man City and Arsenal the ones that went head-to-head -head last year. But Liverpool, despite the fact that Jurgen Klopp moved on, they still have they still have Mo Salah. They still have Darwin Nunez. They still have Trent Alexander-Arnold. They still have Virgil van Dijk. I mean, it is a stacked team, and I don't think they're going to change their play very much. And I think they're going to hang around. They look pretty darn good. I know it's just one game. Yeah. They look pretty darn good in game number one. Man City is looking for whatever you would say for a five peat, cinco peat. Um, this is now Pep Guardiola's chance for seven and eight chances. Um, but this is also Pep's. This is also Pep's last year under contract, and so we'll see what happens there. Um, besides. Arsenal, Man City, and uh, and Liverpool, you know, there's always that who gets that fourth slot that might, you know, the fourth, the top four places get in the Champions League. And that's really where the intrigue is, I think, going to be this year. If you're looking for what's exciting, it's what's beyond Man City, Arsenal, Liverpool. What you're looking for is who between Tottenham, Manchester United, Chelsea last year, Aston Villa made the run and got that champions spot. Newcastle, Brighton, these are all teams that are kind of that second tier. Who's going to fight for that fourth slot? And then, of course, you got the kind of the midfield like West Ham and Crystal Palace, Brentford, Everton, Bournemouth. You know, can any of them challenge and all of a sudden have, uh, you know, this crazy year that, that surprises? I doubt it. But I think some of the things to look for that are exciting is uh, Tottenham signed a world-class scorer in a guy named Dominic Solanke. Didn't really show much in game number one, but I think a lot of eyes are going to be on Dominic Solanke. Another thing to look for is that Brentford has a superstar scorer named Ivan Tony, who hasn't landed yet. The transfer window remains open till the end of August. We don't have a home yet for Ivan Tony. He might even leave to go play in Saudi Arabia. But if he stays in the Premier League and he lands on another team, that would change their fortunes bigly. Um, I think uh, there are some new changes for, you know, Arsenal signed a, a defender, a, a world-class defender, Ricardo Calafiori. If their defense stays Stout, then I think Arsenal could actually change, challenge Man City. 
there's got to be a time at some point that Man City finally fall from the perch, and this might be the year that Arsenal can put it together and catch them. They, you know, they look really good against Chelsea, and they did so without some of their star players like uh, Fodor, right? Yeah, Fodor, um, Phil Foden wasn't Foden. really didn't. Yeah, he didn't play um, in that game. Um, but I, 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 do you agree they're also getting a little long in the tooth? I don't know about that. I mean, Erling Holland's still a young guy. Bernardo Silva's getting up there. De Bruyne um, getting, you know, gets injured. De Bruyne is getting up year. there. They, they, they had a big loss in losing Julian Alvarez uh, to La Liga, but I, you know, kind of all roads are going to continue to go through. Phil Foden had a spectacular year last year. He's young. Erling Holland is still young. Um, their midfield is still decently young. I, Man City is just stacked up and down. Doku is really an impressive player, young player on the left wing. So we'll see. Um, I, you know, it's it's going to be fun. I think in the last few years, we had years where Man City ran away with it. And long before the 38-game season ended, it was over. This year, I really think it's going to come down to the end, kind of like last year, which was very, very exciting. Who's um, Who's at risk to be relegated this year? Well, the three that came up, I think, are all in jeopardy. Southampton, Leicester City, and Ipswich Town. Uh, those are Ed Sheeran's boys. I think all three are going to struggle. There have been a lot of pundits that suggest that Ipswich might surprise. And if so, the other one that's probably in jeopardy is Nottingham Forest. But I think I think the ones that came up are likely to go right back down. Mm-hmm. Interesting concept, you know. We it'd be nice to have wow. that in some of it'd our be unbelievable. U.S. leagues. Unbelievable. I mean, I do think it'll eventually come to U.S. soccer leagues, but I think if it started changing into other sports, it'd be so much fun. It's just so much fun. Yeah, be rough to be a, a Washington fan at that point, but otherwise, it'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, Bison. So let's move on to uh, U.S. football. Um, I think, you know, we've all been kind of itching for this to, to kick back in um, on the on the SMQBs. Uh, and we're not far away. Uh, Fantasy Football League is upon us for sure. Who, who do you think are the most improved teams in the offseason? Oof, most improved. Well, boy, that's a hard question. I mean, even though – even though it's a rookie quarterback, I will say, making fun of Bison, I think the commanders could make could make a move towards a lot more relevancy this year. I think um I think adding Derek Henry to that backfield of the Ravens, I think takes so much pressure off Lamar Jackson. If that right. team can become more than one dimensional, I mean they were already a pretty good team, but that's that's very improved. Um, you know, I think I think Caleb Williams yep. is exciting. DeAndre Swift, I think, is underrated. I think the defense of the Bears got improved, so I think they're going to take a big jump forward. I, th- I do it's, too. I re- I really like Roma Dunze. Yeah, and and Keenan Allen is just money. You know, you just plug that guy in, and he's going to get thousand yards. Uh, and make make a lot of big plays in a game if he's healthy. So uh, pairing him and Rome with DJ Moore, that's a pretty potent um, wide receiving core right there. I, I think the NFC North is the one that I'm the most interested to watch. I mean, the Lions were incredible last year. I think they're going to get that NFL schedule difficulty drop off, kind of drop back a little yeah. bit. Yeah, they've improved their defense, though. So. And they've improved their defense. We'll see what happens with this injury of Jameer Gibbs. Maybe it's not so serious. Um, but I'm really curious about the switch over with the running backs, with Josh Jacobs coming to the Packers and Aaron Jones moving from the Packers over to the Vikings. And while I wasn't really super high on J.J. McCarthy, and if, if they're really going with Sam Darnold, it's not very exciting. But, you know, the Vikings still have, you know, unbelievable talent in Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, you know, at, at the wideouts and and now having Aaron Jones in the backfield. 
I, I, I really, I'm going to be really interested to see how the NFC North plays out. They could put three teams in the playoffs, including two wild card teams. Yep. Yep. I agree. I, I'm really excited to see the Bears. I hope the Caleb uh, Williams thing works. And I also think the Texans didn't add much, but what they added in Joe Mixon could yep. re- be a real difference maker for that team. I mean, well, they look pretty damn good this. against the Giants in the preseason. I'll tell you that. Do you think also on the Texans, do you think Stefan Diggs is addition addition or subtraction kind of addition? What's your take on Diggs? I think he's a bit of a, a cancer in the locker room. He's an, an, an incredible talent, and he's already started to act up in preseason. I think he went after Stroud on the sideline in yeah. a preseason game. That's, yeah. that's a bad way to start out as a new teammate when you have a superstar quarterback. I, I'm afraid that for all of his talent, he's he's just going to follow suit and behave like he did with the Vikings and the Bills. Well, if Eventually he can, wears out his welcome. Yeah, I agree with you. But if somehow he can, if he can behave and if he can just chill out, adding those two pieces to a team that was already on a big rise. With Tank Dell and Nico Collins, yeah. is that his name? And that's a pretty good yeah. receiving add, court right there, too. And a damn add good Diggs, tight add Mixon, add Stroud. Dalton you know, Schultz. That, that's a... That's a team that should should run away with that division. Yeah, yeah. What about teams that aren't the typical terrible teams but might be in trouble after this past offseason? Well, I think we're going to finally see the end of that run of the Steelers yeah, being at least I was, 500. That's just on my list, too. Yeah. I mean, look, so far, Russell Wilson and Justin Fields have both looked like junk yep. uh, in the preseason I, I just think that team has finally, finally met its match. And uh, Tomlin is, is going to see his streak. And I think that's a team that we're going to see drop off. I also, I, I mean, I know that, I know that, uh, you know, the Broncos with uh, Sean, um, what's his face? Peyton, the, the Sean coach, Peyton. Yeah, Peyton. And Bo Nix. I mean, Really? Yeah, is, yeah. I mean, they're suffering. It's, they, in, their GM is in the is in the running with Gettleman for worst ever. I mean, that deal that he made with Russell Wilson has just tanked that team for years. They gave away I so mean, much and got nothing. And the other one is, I mean, I know you're a big Herbert fan, but I'm not sure how Harbaugh's return is going to go and who is Herbert throwing to? He's lost both Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. Like who is he throwing to on that? Team? Well, I'll tell you what fantasy football fans, Lad McConkey is going to have a monster rookie year. Really? Who else is he, Herbert going to throw the ball to? And this guy knows, <laughs> this guy knows how to run routes and get open. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not high on on. I think I think the Chiefs are going to cakewalk that division. I just, yeah. I, you know, the Raiders are going out with Gardner Minshew, <laughs> and the Broncos are going out with Bo Nix, and the Chargers are going out with Justin Herbert throwing to nobody. So, um, you know, so that's that's interesting. I, you know, we haven't really said anything about your boy Saquon. Um, well, well, I think with Saquon's departure, I'm putting the Giants on my list of teams that people thought might be good, but that are in big trouble. We've got a terrible quarterback. We've got Devon, Devon Singletary, who couldn't run the ball all preseason, um, replacing Saquon. So the only thing that Daniel Jones had going for him in his one good year was a stout defense in Saquon Barkley. And yeah. Saquon's gone, and you know he's. I think our running game is going to be bad, and Daniel Jones just looks like he should he should be a second string quarterback, not a forty million dollar man. Well, they're going to have to figure out how to safely keep him running in that offense. I think Jones' best quality is when he 
has that RPO and he escapes out of the pocket and he, he he's off and running. He's, he's, he's fast. He's tough to beat. If he's back in the pocket, he makes way too many mistakes. He doesn't really have a superstar running back anymore. It's going to, the giants are going to have to win a lot of games. If, however many they can win, keeping the team opposing team. Yeah, see, I, I predict that he's going to be similar to the way Carson Wentz was after his terrible injury. And and is not going to be an instinctual runner anymore. I mean, the guy the guy suffered concussions, a broken neck, and a, a torn ACL. Uh, he's I just don't think he's a running quarterback anymore. I think the team that's going to surprise this year, if you can call it a surprise, because they're only a couple years removed from the Super Bowl, I think things got awfully sleepy and quiet about the Cincinnati Bengals. And despite the fact that they lost Mixon, I think they're going to be back big time, big, big time. Uh, I think Burrow's going to have a great year. I think Jamar Chase healthy is going to have a great year. I think their defense has improved. Um, yeah, and I their O line, importantly, has improved. Their O line has improved. So yeah. I, I think the Bengals, it's going to be, I think the Steelers fall off big in that division. Uh, the Ravens are definitely the ones to beat. But I think the Browns versus Bengals is going to be an interesting. Plot, subplot there as to who finishes in the runner up to the Ravens and I and and could the Bengals even surprise and push the Ravens? I just think Derrick Henry pushes that team over uh the top, the Ravens. I, I think we're gonna see again Ravens, Chiefs. I mean, yeah, we should still not forget about the Bills. Um, but Dol- Ravens Dolphins. Yeah, Dolphins. Ravens, Chiefs is where 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 it's at for me in the AFC this year. What about the NFC? I, I I mean, the Eagles got better. Obviously, you want to talk about Saquon. He's one of the top five talented running backs in the league, in my opinion, and I predict he has a monster year for the Eagles. Well, I think the, the there's a, a couple things that are really exciting about the Eagles so far. One is that Jalen looks like he's got his wheels back. He was really uh, nursing – some type of knee issue last year had the brace on for some part of it. The preseason he's shown in practices, he's running at full speed. But what's really exciting is even with the backups, because they haven't played the first teamers yet. They played, you know, this guy, Kenny Pickett and Tanner McKee, <laughs> but you're seeing, you're seeing little blips of Kellen Moore's offense. They've taken the play chart out of Nick Sirianni's hands. Kellen Moore's got the offense and they look really really exciting i'm excited about that i'm excited about jalen being jalen being healthy and i'm excited about using all these weapons but i still think unfortunately and i hate to say this but i still think the nfc runs through the niners um Christian well, which, which rise and fall on mccaffrey who's injured yeah but they don't have like unlike in past years where they had Mostert and you name it plug in Red running back and gains 100 yards plus a game. They don't have that guy anymore behind CMC. If he's hurt, true, that team's in trouble. True. Although they went away a little bit last year from from using Debo uh, in that kind of motion and give him the ball too. We still have not seen the answer to the saga about Brandon Ayuk. I can't believe it keeps going. I still right. think in the end he's going to be back with the Niners. But if they have that full complement of, you know, uh, Kittle and Ayuk and Debo and CMC and Purdy and that crazy good defense, I don't know. I don't know how you pick somebody in front of the Niners, even as stacked as the Eagles are. You know, Ayuk had to have watched that Steelers preseason game where both Russell <laughs> and and Fields played and said, oh, hell no. There's no way I'm going there. No way. Um, the other the other thing that is really interesting is I think the rookie quarterbacks, I think we, we've now heard as of today, Bison was celebrating Jaden Daniels gonna start for the commanders. Yep. Caleb's gonna start for, for the Bears. And I, I think I think you're likely to see Drake May start for the Patriots. And if Bo not, Nick's he'll be starting on. for the Broncos. Right. So you're gonna see all these guys that were kind of champion is like the class of quarterbacks someone's going to be a rising star and probably at least a couple of them are going to be big failures but i'm excited to see that part of this year's 
quarterback crop is to see how these rookies do. And I'm kind of curious to see how Kirk Cousins, I've never been a Cousins fan, but the Falcons are an interesting team. They got so much talent in the backfield. They still have an underutilized Kyle Pitts. I'm kind of intrigued to see. Yeah. I think I think the Falcons pull off that division. Sorry, Milk. Yeah, I think they win that division. They don't have what it takes to go far in the playoffs. They did nothing to improve their pass rush uh, other than trading for that Patriots uh, outside linebacker. What is it, Judon? Um, yeah, Patrick Judon. It's not enough. Their their defensive backfield is untested, um, but their offense is high powered and, and is enough to get through that division. I agree. What about the, in back to the NFC? What about the Packers? You think they're going to be as good as they were last year at the end of the year? I mean, they were so impressive by the end of that year. By the end of the year, and um, I, I, I guess from 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 all accounts, from what we saw at the end of last year, Jordan Love. Looks like that, you know, that long waiting game was worth it, and he's the yep. real deal. And they've got young, very good wide receivers. I don't think we've seen the full bloom yet of Christian Watson. And they've got two other dangerous receivers. And you know, now you've got Josh Jacobs, who yeah, who led the league in yards. rushing two years. Yes, ago. yeah. So I, you know. I, I think the Eagles struggle in game one in Brazil. You know, the NFL is going for the first time to Brazil this year and opening up the Steelers, excuse me, the Eagles uh, Packers. And I I think the Eagles struggle in that one. I think the Packers look really good at the end of last season. And, they, and the Eagles are still putting some pieces together. And by the way, the last thing, come back to the Eagles, in terms of players who have moved around or gone I think we're going to see just how much the Eagles miss Jason Kelsey and what a driver he was on that team. Right. Um, right. right. He's a, Cam Jordan is nice, but center is a tough position to replace as huge. the, as the bucks found out last year. Exactly. Um, so I, we probably both agree the Eagles come out on top in the East. Who's, who's second in the East in your opinion? I mean, every, it should be the Cowboys. It but, should be the Cowboys. But they looked I mean, horrible uh, against the Packers in the playoffs last year, and the Commanders seem to be on the rise. I wonder if the Commanders can knock them off for the number two spot. I think the Commanders get somewhere around eight and nine, nine and eight, but I don't think they put together the kind of 10 or 11 wins they need to get in the playoffs. And I think the Cowboys can still assemble 10 or 11 wins. I'd be shocking with that defense and still the talent that they have on various, you know, talent pieces on offense, boy, would it be a major, major, major disappointment if that team doesn't put together 11 wins and makes the playoffs. Right. I mean, they they probably will, and they probably will lose early again. They just yeah. haven't, they haven't gotten any better in the off season and other teams have. Um, anyway, anything else on the NFL? Not really. Um, do you think Geno Smith can keep it going in in Seattle? Do you think he's still got stuff left in the tank? Because that's an interesting team if he does. I, you know, I thought after two years ago that he had just turned the corner and was the real deal. Last year, he played like the year before was a bit of a fluke. So it's hard to say because you're right. They have a hell of a receiving core adding Jack, Jackson Smith and Jeeba, a healthy Jackson Smith and Jeeba to, to their two st- stud wide receivers. They didn't, they pick up a good running back too. And then, yeah. And then the other one that we didn't, the other team that we didn't talk about, which I'm, I'm, I guess, how can we forget? It's too, too hard to forget that annoying pain in the ass, Aaron Rodgers <laughs> and a, a, a Jets team you know, that has Garrett Wilson, that picked up Mike Williams, that has Brees Hall, that has, you know, some nice defensive pieces. Like if Aaron Rodgers is healthy, and that's the biggest capital letters, if, can the Jets finally not jet? The Jets still have a Swiss cheese offensive line. And I mean, the game, the first game of last year, Aaron Judge looked terrified because – the pass rush was like a jail. Aaron Rodgers. 
Aaron Rodgers. We're about to get the judge. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. I just, my gut tells me that Aaron Rodgers gets hurt again early in the year and the Jets are done. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably but you're right. True. They have everything else they need. They need an offensive line and a healthy, good quarterback. I really like that running back. I really like Brees Hall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just don't think 40 something year old quarterbacks are are the answer anymore, especially on a team with a bad offensive line. We'll see. Hope I'm wrong because it would be nice to see the Jets good again. So um, excited for the NFL. You want to talk a little baseball? How many home runs is Aaron Judge going to hit in his career? He just hit 300 this past week, and he's something like 30 years old. Um, maybe a little older. Can he get – I think the numbers were that if he does another six years at 50 averaging, which would be a lot, he can get to 600. Does he make that magic 600 number? You know, it's – it's hard to imagine because with all the money he makes, I, I just, you know, it's hard to keep playing when, when you, you hmm. that, I mean, the, the guys like Ken Griffey Jr. Played how many years, you know, do, a dozen or more years. Um, of course, Hank Aaron played close to 20 years. I don't see judge doing that, but if anyone could do it, I think it would be him. He might be a, He's so damn big and playing center field. It's just amazing. He doesn't get hurt more. Um, yeah. But he's, I just love the guy. I think he's the a, really a perfect face of major league baseball. He's, he, he is so um, humble and, and just such a class act. I mean, he owns the home run record for the American league at 62 He's the youngest player in the history of baseball to get the 300 home runs. Um, you know, one of the the third youngest guy to do it was your boy, Ryan Howard. You're right. Yeah. 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 If you, for, you forget what a great career that guy had. If it weren't for an Achilles injury, yeah. it would be a very different story. Yeah. But anyway, Judge has all these stats, and this year he's having a, another great year. I think he's – He's batting somewhere around 330. He's already got 111 RBIs in August. He's got 44 home runs. I mean, he could do another – he could have another 60 to 63 home run year this year and break his own record. And yet, every time the guy – you put a microphone in front of the guy, all he wants to talk about is how Juan Soto is the greatest hitter in baseball. That's just the type of guy he is. He's just yeah, an amazing Yeah, he's, he's definitely cut from the cloth of a Jeter. He's a Jeter-type yeah, guy. yeah. Yeah, he is. He's good for baseball, and I and I always say, you can hate the Yankees, but you have to love Aaron Judge. You really do. Yeah, yeah. No, no. He's he's not. He's just not a unlikable guy. The Yankees have had some unlikable guys before. He's not that. Um, like Soto is brash, and he's got all his antics that you know. I think sometimes people don't like Soto for that kind of stuff. That's just not Judge. No, right. Soto cracks me up with all of his facial expressions at the plate. You know, like he's, like if the guy gets a if someone gets a pitch by him, that's a strike. He's nodding his head like, "Yep, yep, that's a strike." You're not going to see that happen too much. <laughs> but did you see that little clip from the the uh, little league classic between the Yankees and the Tigers? I guess it was last night, where Soto does that thing where he kind of gets really low and he rides back and forth. And there were a whole bunch of little leaguers that were over the dugout and they know that move that he does. And so the camera angle had Soto do that. And then all the kids do that. Like he is worshiped by these kids. Yeah, I mean, a funny. lot of these kids like to play that kind of brash style and they like to see, you know, these guys where they can mimic. And that was just a great, great scene for baseball. The other scene I've seen like that in past years that cracks me up is um, was it Papelbon who, um, before a pitch, would get into that like bird wing position? Oh no, that's what's his face? Who's um, uh, he was Craig on the Kimbrel. Philly, Craig Kimbrel, and right, the Kimbrel. kids would get behind home plate and yeah, do yeah, the yeah. same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It. It's funny. It's funny. Speaking of which, it's so bizarre how Baltimore has become like Philly East. There's all these like castoffs from the Phillies, but. 
what's going to make this race between, which is just so, so awesome to watch this Orioles versus Yankees race. So Kimbrell, who was with the Phillies, basically failed out. And now he's been replaced by another former Phillies closer that wasn't really pitching that well. But now since the, 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 uh, you know, the trade deadline, Sir Anthony Dominguez, Hmm. who's now the new Baltimore closer has been lights out. And how do you think this whole race is going to play out between the two of these teams? You know, this could, this is, I think, going to be the most exciting race in baseball. There's, what, le- less than 40 games left in the season. Yankees and the Orioles are tied at, at 73 and 51 as of the end of yesterday. I mean, it's going to go down to the wire, and they have they have a late September series against each other. Um I've, I've been saying for three years, you know this, that it would be great for baseball if the Orioles, the Reds, the A's, the Pirates, teams like that became good again. Well, the, the Orioles are back, baby. I mean, this is two years in a row, and their team is young, and they still have talent yeah, the, in the minors. And the, the best farm system in baseball. Right yeah, now. I mean, they're, they're going to be good for a while, and it's great for baseball. Um, I, think, I think they're they're the real deal. And you saw earlier this year, the Yankees are capable of losing 10 games in a row anytime. Um, if the Yankees starting pitching doesn't hold up, I give it to the Orioles. Um, but the Yankees are playing great right now. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, it's a, it's a tough one to call. I thought yeah, we... your, your division, the NL East would be similar, but what the hell happened to the Braves? I mean, the, the, the Philly, the Phillies are 73 and 51, despite a, pretty bad losing streak of their own recently. And the Braves made zero headway during that losing streak. And the Braves just got one more. Yeah. Did somebody break their hand? Riley Austin Riley. Yeah. Austin Riley. So, you know, you add to the Strider and the Acuna. I mean, honestly, if the Braves do make the playoffs and make any noise, it is some hell of a job by that manager yeah. to get through all of that. But it, it's just eventually going to be too much to withstand. But, you know, I'm looking for, we have a great listener, the nerd, Nick Verderame, um, from Arizona. And he sent this suggested topic for us to talk about. He sent this stat about the team's records since the All-Star break. Now, the Phillies have improved a little bit since then, but they were near bottom. But listen to these records since the All-Star break. And this was, this was okay, this was as of five days ago, so it's maybe changed a little bit. The Padres are 18 and four and have surged into yep. a playoff spot. Yep. And last year's runners up, Nerd's own Diamondbacks, who we wrote off for dead, is are, are 19 and five since the All Star break. And, and, and look out here once again, go the Astros, right. who are on a run too. The Twins were 10 um, games up and have now played themselves out of a 10-game lead to the point where they may not be in wildcard contention. I'm not the Twins, the um, Mariners. The Mariners. Yeah the, yeah, the Mariners have been really struggling. They they're only, they were 11-11. I think they're even a little worse than that. A lot, a lot of teams have struggled. And it's funny because I, I was saying on a pod a couple weeks ago how – you know, Bison was ribbing me how the steel uh, the Steelers how the I don't know why I keep saying that but how the how the uh, the Phillies were going to struggle after the All Star break. Just I thought just to jinx me, but we talked about this a couple weeks ago. It is fascinating how the All Star break can change a team's mojo for the better or for the worse. Right. Some of the right. really really good teams have really struggled. Um, the Braves, the Rangers, the Phillies. The Cardinals, the Red Sox, all who were positioning themselves all have struggled bigly since the All-Star break. Well, the Yankees did too until they ripped off a good winning streak. Um, But with respect to teams like the Padres and the um, Diamondbacks, I think those were good teams that were underperforming and after the All-Star break started playing to their potential. I mean, they are good young teams, especially the Padres. The Padres are loaded with talent. Um, they should be good. They're supposed to be good. Uh, you know, n- another one of these teams to, to to look that goes into your category of, you know, A's, Reds, Orioles. 
Uh, this Bobby Witt led Kansas City Royals team mm -hmm. has reeled off another four wins in a row and are now just three games back of the Cleveland Guardians in the AL Central. And that would be really, really fun also to to, to see the Royals back at it in such a small market. Yep. You know, building building from a farm system, building around another, you know, number one draft pick and Bobby Witt. Really, uh, really good story for baseball. The Twins are two games back. I mean, that's a tight division that the Guardians have led pretty much all season. So there's a, there's going to be some really interesting, uh, exciting, tight races um, coming down the wire. The NL East and the NL Central will not be two of those. Uh, the Brewers are running away with it, and so are the Phillies. But most of the other divisions are, are tight, and there's, there's going to be some real – uh, battles for wild card spots. It'll be what'd fun you to think watch. Of, Rooster, what'd you think of players weekend with the cleats and the bats and all that stuff? You know, I know you're expecting me to be like Mr. Old school and say it's silly. And I didn't, didn't like it. Um, just for the listeners, the, the, the players weekend is this popular themed weekend where the players get to sort of break the traditional rules uh, regarding uniforms and equipment and sort of express their individuality. Um, and this year it seems like the crayon themed bats are all that and the crazy cleats. Um, I think it's a brilliant marketing move by baseball to attract more young hip kids, which they need to do. Baseball, baseball for a while there was some a sport that only – older white guys were watching and they can't survive with that demographic. They have to expand the base. And this is a fun way to do it. I mean, you've got one of the guys I've been talking about all year as somebody I didn't really know much about until this year. And it's just an awesome, awesome pitcher. This guy on the tigers, Tariq Scooball. Yeah. His nickname he, he, is probably Scoob. When it's Cy Young for the AL. Yeah, his nickname is Scoob. So he comes out in a Scooby-Doo cleats <laughs> during players weekend it's it's fun the kids love it I, i'm all for it i'm sure bison hates it <laughs> yeah he definitely he definitely had the hmm emoji but i'm very biased about this because because one of my kids uh this summer interned for victus bats and people hadn't heard of victus bats uh really until the last couple of years but now they've got the exclusive for major league baseball next year meaning they can do a lot more things with the bats it doesn't mean players all players have to use them but the days of louisville slugger being the only bat that players use is, is, is long gone and um there's a there's a aluminum bat maker named marucci bats and and they also make wood bats a lot of the players in the major leagues use marucci and they bought this company called victus which is a suburban philly company Invictus made a lot of these fun bats for Players Weekend. They've got this guy, the Bat King, who who designs these the, the way you would design custom cars. And if you haven't, if, if listeners, if you haven't seen some of these custom bats from Players Weekend, it is really, really fun. It lets the players kind of show out for weekend. And exactly what you said, it brings these kids who are so busy, you know, with their short attention span turning to only, you know, the things that are fun playing video games of like, you know, NBA 2K and, and Madden NFL and bas you know, basketball, football, ba bringing baseball back to that generation and getting youth involved through that players weekend. Like you said, genius marketing by the MLB, big, big thumbs up to that. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, and also the, some of these players choose to use the, the, the uniform or the cleats to market their favorite charity. So it, also it, good. it shows the players as being, you know, somebody other than a guy making a ton of money. It's, it's, it's a good, it's a good thing all, all around to just have a weekend where you get to know the players a little bit better on a personal level. Um, <clears throat> let's, let's uh, do it. Let's, let's move on from baseball. Do you have a punchable face this week, House? Not really. Um, I think I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna spare the punches this week. I don't. There's not really a story that's so 
so bad someone's deserving of a punch. Yeah, I I, I don't have one either. So um, how about a lasso? No. We're no wrapping this up early. All right. I have a buzzer beater. I, I actually sent it to Bison last week, and he, he didn't cover it. But I think this is a pretty interesting story. Do you remember Robinson Cano? Oh, sure. Second, second baseman, baseman came, came sure. up with the Yankees. Sure. Jeter used to Jeter used to call him Canoe. Um, they went on and signed a huge deal with the Mariners. Made two hundred sixty million dollars in the course of his career. He was an eight-time um, All Star. He was a really good player, good hitter. Um, his career was stained a little bit by some allegations of um, PEDs, um, but he's now forty-one years old has all kinds of money, and just for the pure love of the game, he's still playing baseball in the Mexican League, mm. where the Diablos, and is on the same team actually with Trevor Bauer, um, they are 71-19 and 19 this oh year. Oh, my God. <laughs> and he is the best hitter in the league at age 41. It's, it's really kind of a, a fun well, story a New York Times covered a, a week ago. Yeah, I think I think other than the PEDs, I would have put in it as a lasso. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about you? The my buzzer beater, and I know especially Pope and Milk are chomping at the bit for next week when we're back on the pod talking about college football. Next weekend, we have the big matchup overseas between Georgia Tech and Florida State, which kind of kicks off our college football season and it is going to be a really crazy season it is uh you know a a, a season where we finally don't have nick satan around and we'll see what the shockwaves that sends to the sec not to mention the addition of texas and oklahoma in the sec and not to mention all these former pac-10 teams now playing mostly over over in the the Big Ten. So there's a lot of changes in the college football season. We'll give you the the full rundown and preview next week, but that's my buzzer beater. I'm just excited for that. The burning question is, midway through the year, when Alabama is bad, who is going to be Pope's favorite team? (laughs) You know, now that that Texas has been – I'm secretly thinking that that, – Pope, we'll find out if Pope listens all the way to the end of this week's episode. I know he's gonna because we're gonna get a, a middle finger emoji about Pope choosing Texas in the middle of the season <laughs> once Bama <laughs> fails. All right, all right, good, good deal. Any other buzzers? That's it. Everybody all right, have well, Pope, a really good Pope, Bison, week. and uh, Milk. We look forward to having you rejoin next week. Hope you guys had a great weekend, and uh, we'll see you then. Have a good one. All right.